was initially planned around engaging with SASO. Last year, I think it was September 19th, we all formed a human chain uh, and uh, we placed a memorandum of demands uh, to SASO and we wanted to know what their just transition plan is given that they are the second highest carbon emitter in the country. They subsequently wrote us and they basically responded to some of the issues that we raised in our memorandum. We felt that the way to take it forward was to invite them to a closed meeting, which would have happened at WITS, um, but as we know, coronavirus has hit. But we would have had a close, closed space engagement with them, uh, involving uh, one of our leading climate scientists, both at WITS and in the country, uh, Francois Engelbrecht, who's here with us. But at the same time, involve activists from um, SASOL affected communities, the trade unions, and ourselves. So we really have a serious closed door engagement around this just transition plan. And what are their commitments to phase out, basically? Because this is where the conversation is at in the context of the climate crisis. Unfortunately, they wrote us and told us that the timing was bad for them. Uh, so instead, we've converted this session into developing our response to SASOL. So what comes out of our presentations, our engagements, etc., we will write up into a document, which we will then send to SASOL. Okay, is that clear to everybody? All right. So, to lead our engagement, uh, we have Francois Engelbrecht, who I've mentioned. Francois um, is a professor at Wits University in the Global Change Institute. He's one of our leading climate scientists at Wits. Um, he works on modeling and other interesting uh, issues like flashpoints, climate flashpoints in southern Africa. He works with the IPCC, uh, uh, the UN IPCC process, um, and he even advises our government at the highest of levels, uh, and so on. So we're really, really um, honored to have you, Francois. Uh, thank you for making the time. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vish. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Thanks a lot again, Jan and Vish, for the invite to, 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 to talk to this meeting today. Um, I'm going to focus, I'm, pre I'm presenting to you um, for your background and hopefully for uptake in your own thinking and work going forward, the, the current understanding that we have about climate change impacts in the Southern African region moving forward. Um, I was part of the IPCC special report that was issued in 2018, the special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And currently I'm, I'm serving as one of the lead authors in assessment report 6 of the IPCC, with the physical science base should be published by March next year. And then we'll follow the, the other two reports on adaptation and policy uh, a few months later in, in 2021. So I'll share some of the latest science and um, I'm going to focus the talk um, around the fact that the IPCC in 2018 classified the Southern African region as one of a number of climate change hotspots globally. So we are, we are in fact regarded as one of the most vulnerable regions on the planet and I'll try to explain why that is the case. So let me start by showing this graphic, which uh, is a good way to introduce this narrative of us being a climate change hotspot in Southern Africa. It shows um, temperatures across the world for the summer period of 2015-16, that's December to February 2015-16, Southern Hemisphere summer. And um, in dark red, we can see those parts of the world where the all-time temperature records were broken during that summer season. And what you can see is that across the entire southern African region, every, every single weather station broke its all-time record in terms of December to February average temperature. So it, it was an absolutely exceptional summer. But of course it occurred during the year 2050, 
which at the time was the warmest year ever measured by humans since measurements began in 1850. And 2015 is also the landmark year during which the global average surface temperature was for the first time one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial average temperature. So unfortunately halfway towards exceeding the Paris Agreement threshold of two degrees Celsius. And then 2016 was of course warmer. That was the warmest year and it, it remains the warmest year on record. Last year was the second warmest on record. But during this exceptionally warm year, also take note of the fact that there were two parts in the world where we saw temperatures far below normal. This area north of the Antarctic Peninsula and the area south of Greenland. And those are the parts of the world where the so-called deep water forms, that is an important part of the ocean circulation. But what was happening in that season, and since then we've observed this more and more often, we have large quantities of fresh water melting from the glaciers and that fresh water is not very dense, it lingers close to the surface it's supposed to be sinking if it's high salinity water and um, we then have these, these, cool pool, these cool pools of fresh water lingering in those places and that, that upsets the global ocean circulation which is another story but um, that certainly was a year when we saw many of the alarming aspects of climate change that have been predicted for a long time um, in action. Okay, a bit more background, just for interest sake, last year, 2019, if we look at the annual average temperatures, we can see the, the record warmest year once again um, for our region. Our region is always part of those that are, the, that are the most severely affected when it comes to temperature changes. So if we look at annual average temperature, last year was the warmest on record across the entire Angola, Namibia, Botswana, and much of the Northern Cape and Western Cape in South Africa. Now South Africa was on track to have its warmest year on record. If it was not for the good rains we've had in November and December, we also would have had, in the eastern South Africa, the warmest year on record. So if you look at January to October, it was the warmest year on record across the entire South Africa. I did the warmest 10 months on record. So, um, we are certainly living in the times of global warming. I don't think I have to really mention that to anybody in this audience, but <laughs> if, you, if you want to make use of the statistics, the last five years are, of course, the warmest five years on record since we began with reliable measurements in 1850. And if we look at the 20 warmest years of record, on the, the 20 warmest years on record, 19 of those occurred in the last 20 years. So there's, there's no doubt that we are living in the days of, of global warming. Now, a bit more background on our region. <coughs> what, happens, what happened during the big... Um, drought of 2015-16, that exceptionally warm summer, mm -hmm. is that we had a very big El Niño event in the Pacific Ocean. And should these El Niño events, which, which, which refers to the large-scale warming mm -hmm. of the central tropical Pacific Ocean, should they occur more frequently, we can expect in our region what happened back in 2015-16, which is, of course, widespread drought. So the summer of 2015-16 was for many parts of South Africa the third summer in a row with below normal rainfall. And we saw severe impacts across the region. And that's important. So I will, I will later on in this talk demonstrate that in a changing climate, the Southern African region is likely to experience more of these types of droughts. So, during this big drought, we saw, firstly, a big reduction in the maize crop that year. The South Africans will remember the losses in cattle we've had in Northwest Province, was it Natal Province, Mbopa, Eastern Cape. But Botswana, 
Botswana was perhaps the most severely hit by that drought. It lost 20% of its cattle in 2015, and in 2016 it lost another 20%. That's what a big El Nino drought can do in Southern Africa. And it's also because of the heat waves. If we count heat wave days since 1970, 71, all the way through to today, or the summer of 1560, you can see how across those weather stations in South Africa, <coughs> heat wave events are occurring more and more frequently over time. It is that combination of severe heat stress with drought that is of course so harmful to crops in Southern Africa, to the staple crop maize, but also to our cattle. So, um, so take note of the fact that this is a region with a variable climate. We do get big droughts from time to time, but now they are occurring during significantly hotter conditions than in the past. Um, I can show you all kinds of interesting statistics. I'll, so now I'll just show one graph. This is on the, on the y-axis. On the x-axis it shows rainfall anomalies in the northwest and three state provinces of South Africa. On the y-axis it shows sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. And what it shows is when the Pacific Ocean gets very hot, we are usually dry <coughs> in some area. And if the Pacific Ocean is cool, we are typically having wet conditions in Southern Africa. Yeah. But the, the, the red dot there, the top left, that shows, in terms of sea surface temperature, the biggest El Nino ever measured. And you can see on the x-axis it was the driest summer um, in the northwest and three state provinces dating back to 1901 when we had some reasonably reliable observations available. Now, um, just a fair bit of background. These years that are so wet over Southern Africa, we should not forget about them, of course. They are also a major risk. And the changes that are projected in terms of these wet years is another reason why the, reg why the, reason is, uh, why the region is identified as a hotspot. I will, I will soon close the loop. <coughs> this is just a bit of background still. Um, February 2. 2000, that was tropical cyclone Eileen making landfall um, over Mozambique. As some of you will remember, the South African Defence Force had very big rescue operations in Mozambique um, in relation to those floods. But in the end, more than 700 people died in these floods. And that was across Madagascar, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and also in the Popo province in South Africa. We had this, this big loss of life. Um, but then, of course, last year, something even more severe happened. So this is tropical cyclone Idai. It made landfall exactly over Bayer at midnight on the 14th of March last year. So here you can see um, the eye of the storm just before landfall. So, Beira has about 500,000 inhabitants and um, several hundreds of people died in Beira when this storm made land. It, it brought with it a very big storm surge, which is effectively a big wall of seawater that is, that is um, generated by the very strong winds blowing around the center of the cycle. And some eyewitness reports are of a, of a a wall of water coming from the ocean, a storm surge of about four meters high, which is of course an absolutely devastating event. Um, Beira is also built on the banks of the Pungwe River, so the rivers of course also came down that, that contributed to the flooding in Beira. But in the end, in, because of this cyclone, more than a thousand people <coughs> lost their lives in Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Malawi. Okay, one person in Madagascar. So, I think too few, people, too few people realize that this is the biggest flood disaster in the recorded history of the Southern African region. And the second biggest in the recorded history of the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so that the last time that more than a thousand people died in a big storm in the Southern Hemisphere was back in 1892 in Mauritius. That was also a tropical cycle. 
So for me, this is extremely important because it shows how vulnerable we are. And remember, we don't have big sea walls on our eastern seaboard. So countries such as Japan and the United States are much better protected in terms of big sea walls that takes away the biggest brunt of the storm surge. Plus, they have excellent transport structures. They can quickly, within a few days, evacuate a million people out of the wake of such a storm. In this case, the, the short-term weather predictions were accurately predicting landfall at Beira of this storm three days ahead of landfall. Yet, when the storm reached Beira, Despite the fact that the Mozambique government did disseminate the warnings, the storm still found all the inhabitants in bay. Remember, with, without a good transport structure, you can't get out of bay. Right? It's a very big flat plain. Even if you start walking with your children, you'll just be caught by the storm. Mm. Because the flat plain is about 200 kilometers broad. You can't, get, you can't walk out of its path. So, it demonstrated how ex it was just another demonstration about how extremely vulnerable we are. And that is true across the developing world, where you don't have that, the infrastructure that can provide some protection. That's how, the, how it looked in the wake of the storm. So there you can see a, a big inland lake <coughs> that lasted several weeks after landfall because of all this rainfall that was dropped on the big plains in, in Mozambique. And then, just a month later, we had a, a Manzum Toti floods, uh, mudslides in South Africa. More than 80 people died in those floods and mudslides. So, whenever you, you find yourself in, in informal housing, or where, where we have um, settlements below the flood line, there's extreme danger in South Africa, because very often we get these intense thunderstorms that can bring flash floods, as happened in this case. And then, of course, we had a tornadoes, a big, big outbreak of tornadoes, one of the biggest tornado seasons South Africa has ever seen the last summer. Now, in the case of extreme thunderstorms in general, I can say we have very clear statistical proof that they are occurring more frequently. And it's not too difficult to understand that in a, in a warmer atmosphere, the laws of thermodynamics determine that there can be more moisture in storm. And eventually there's more rainfall being produced by storm, also by tropical cyclone. The tornadoes occur so rarely in South Africa that we don't really have the statistics to prove that they are in place. But that is something we may be eventually be able to do from physical principles. But take note of the fact that we are also extremely vulnerable in this region in terms of big flooding. Okay, so now, uh, now I'm going to start to talk about how climate change is changing or not. For now I can just mention that across the world there is evidence that, it, that when extreme storms occur, whether they are thunderstorms or whether they are tropical cyclones, they tend to bring rainfall, more rainfall than in the past, purely because they can hold more moisture than but, but let's look more formally at climate change projections for the region. The first slide um, is showing trends, so this is not yet a projection. And, and then, I'll, then I'll start to talk about how we really predict the future. But the most simplest way to predict the future is, of course, just to look what has been happening over the last few decades and extrapolate linearly into the future. And if we, if we just do that for a start, um, we are already getting messages of drastic change in our region. So that slide is in fact showing the observed rate of temperature increase in Africa. And the units on the y-axis is degrees Celsius per century. Okay. So where you see these, these dark yellow regions, these are regions in South Africa and Southern Africa where temperatures are currently rising at a rate of more than 2 degrees Celsius per century. Yeah. And if you go into these dark red regions, that's where the observed rate of warming is in fact more than 3 degrees Celsius per century. And I think we all know that over the last century the global temperature has risen 
by about one degree Celsius. So the, the important thing to take note of is that in Southern Africa, because of our unique regional climate system, the temperatures are rising at about twice, in the order of twice the global rate of warming. It's a bit less along the coastal areas, and it's higher than 2 degrees deep in the, into the interior of the Botswana and Zambia. So that means something very, very important for our region. It means that even if the Paris Agreement is very successfully and aggressively implemented, and we can restrict global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, it means our region is still committed to a warming of 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. So that's the best we can hope. Mm. There will be a range of impacts associated with that warming of 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. We know it's coming, so we need to start to prepare for it. And, and then, of course, should the global temperature rise to more than 2 degrees Celsius, the global temperature increase becomes, say, 3 degrees Celsius, then, of course, we should start to think what that means. What does a 6 degree regional temperature increase mean for Southern Africa? But the fact that the temperatures in our region is warming at twice the global rate of warming, in combination with this natural occurrence of drought and big flood events, is an important part, um, of important reasons why the IPCC classify the region as a hotspot in terms of climate change. Now, moving into predictions, and I would like to say a few things about mitigation along the way. When, when we project future climate change, and, uh, and my understanding from, from Bish is that I should give an overview of, of what these projections are for the region. But when we make the predictions, or the projections, we of course make these projections as a function of a certain mitigation path, or emission scenario. So, so many of the projections I will show you is, for the, is represented by the thick black line on the graphic. That is how a so-called low mitigation pathway looks like. Mm -hmm. That remains the pathway we are still finding ourselves on today, unfortunately, despite all the, despite the Paris Agreement and all the negotiations around it. So, right now, we are heading towards doubling carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere that's double their natural value. That's more, we're heading towards that more or less at 2050. And you can see there right towards the end of the century we are approaching um, four times, starting to approach four times the natural value. That's a low mitigation. Um, the Paris Agreement is calling for this type of future where we see drastic reductions, I'll, I'll give the statistics soon, in carbon dioxide emissions, and then of course we need in some way to get some of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in the second half of the century. That's called carbon dioxide removal, which is technology we don't really have available, that can, not in the form where it can really be applied at that scale where it's needed. Um, but that, those are the very different worlds uh, we can still to some extent choose as choose between as humanity. Um, in a low mitigation future, the global temperature is projected to rise with something between 3.2 and 5.4 degrees Celsius towards the end of the century. And in a Paris Agreement type mitigation effort, we may be able to restrict the global temperature increase to 2 degrees Celsius. So, a few more thoughts on that. The IPCC in its special report um, focused very, very carefully, firstly on what we need to do to restrict global warming to preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius, else 2 degrees Celsius. That's the one thing it did. Then it looked at, at current rates of emissions. When, we may, when may we expect to exceed these critical thresholds? And thirdly, it looked at impacts of climate change at 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming. 
So um, this is one of the graphics that, that are now well known. It effectively says that if we are going to continue at the current rate of with the current rate of carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere, we may exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold as early as 2030. 30. And the 2 degree threshold may be reached somewhere in the late 2040. That's more or less the current output. If we want to avoid that happening, if we want to avoid 1.5 degrees Celsius, as you may well have seen the statistics, the world needs to reduce carbon, carbon dioxide emissions with 45% by 2030. And then, that is with respect to the 2010 <coughs> And then by the year 2050, we need to achieve net zero emissions. So that's the basic guide. If we can do that, we have a good chance of staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, should we give up on that, we only have until 2070 to, to achieve net zero emissions in order to avoid a 2 degree threshold from being exceeded. So as you all know, and as we all know, that's the immense challenge we now are facing. Because if we are not going to achieve staying below these thresholds, we will see the impacts of what is known as dangerous climate change. Okay, that's what I will talk about in the rest of the, the presentation, except for the next slide, which is just a, a reminder of from where the mitigation effort needs to, to come. Right? And I'm sure this community is very much aware of these statistics. But effectively, as things are standing right now, I think this, these are statistics for uh, one or two years ago. Africa's share in the emissions globally was about 4%. If we look at the historical responsibility since 1850, the Afri Africa's share is less than a percent. So, the, the, the issue of historical responsibility, but even current responsibility, of course, we are only holding about 4% of the world's emissions, which is really important also in terms of realizing that um, much of the growth in emissions will come from Africa and Asia over the next century, so we, we have some responsibilities, but it's also important for uh, North America and Europe, where the historical responsibility resides, Japan, to of course take the lead and also the financial lead in the mitigation effort. But anyway, I'm sure you've been speaking a lot about that when you your work. Um, it's, very, it's very, very important that China and the larger Asian region, where we have 56% 50, of emissions currently, will of course actively participate in the Paris Agreement. We should also realize that if that is not going to happen, if there's not going to be powerful participation from the US and China, um, we are not going to stay below these thresholds. So there is a lot of expectation uh, to see what is going to happen with the conference of the party meetings at the end of the year because there was a lot of hope that China specifically will play a leading role and start with the European, with the European Union lead the mitigation effort. Um, but now of course also with the coronavirus, even that, this critical issue, that's another impact right, of the virus, is probably not receiving the attention it would have received by now in the international community towards the big meeting. This is the, this is the meeting, by the way, during which the Paris Agreement comes into effect and during which all the countries of the world must renew their formal commitments in terms of emission reductions. And we all know, of course, that we are not going to get help from the United States right now at the meeting. They are withdrawing. They are withdrawing formally from the Paris Agreement. The withdrawal becomes formal on the 5th of November, so they won't be there. Okay, so that, that is why the hope is for China and the European Union to take a significant step up in terms of commitments at that meeting. Um, so this was one big development of last year. And the other one is, of course, um, 
the development in which many of you are involved in and we are involved in now at the university. Of course, last year we've seen the rise of climate change activism like never before. And um, this was from the previous meeting, I think, organized by this group. Um, the climate strikes that took place in South Africa. So these are some of my colleagues that took those photographs. These were also in the meeting in the March. But um, it was at a time this, which appeared to be this very positive statement being made by the South African government at the climate change summit. So the, 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 South African, the, the South African submission, which was actually uh, coming from the president himself, was calling for an 11 billion US dollar just transition transaction, largely aimed at replacing the <coughs> Malanga coal plants and uh, with an alternative, alternative form of energy. So I'm sure that is something that we are, that you are of course discussing, that we are discussing. But for now, I should just mention that there are certainly within South Africa's climate change directive in the Department of Environmental Affairs and Forestry, uh, climate change policy makers that are very, very much committed to the mitigation effort in South Africa. And they've been instrumental in setting up this state. So they are, they are very, very aligned people, I think, with what we are thinking as climate change scientists or as activists in government. We should take note of their existence. We should also take note of the immense investment it requires to make this transition. I think that's a big part of the discussion. It's an immense investment. Under the Paris Agreement, this should be facilitated through uh, funds such as the Green Climate Fund and through very cheap loans by the developed countries that form part of the Paris Agreement. So in theory, there are mechanisms to help make this happen in the developing world. In, in practice, of course, that funding is not really at the, at the level where it should to really make things happen. Okay, now quickly, just a few slides on projections. If the mitigation effort fails versus when it succeeds, what are the impacts in Southern Africa? So I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, Firstly, I want to point out that the IPCC, um, in the special report, summarized this across many different sectors. But I'll just mention two aspects. In terms of the unique and threatened ecosystems of the planet, we, of course, expect a scale-up in impacts as we reach these thresholds of 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming. Perhaps the most striking is at 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, we will have lost all of the world's warm coral reefs. So that, that wonderful part of our natural heritage, but also a really important productive ecosystem, is completely gone at 2 degrees Celsius of global warming. Even at 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, we will lose 90% of the world's warm coral reefs. That's one, one example of a global impact. The other one, and this is a major concern, is of course what, what the IPCC calls large-scale singular events. Mm -hmm. And that includes the, the big ice caps of Greenland and Antarctica. And currently the risk is high, that's the assessment from the IPCC, that somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius, we will reach a tipping point where we trigger the irreversible melting of the big ice sheets. So when, when the dynamics of those massive ice sheets are in working and they are melting, we have no technology to, to turn it around. So that means there's another aspect of climate change that becomes important. Somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, climate change becomes irreversible. That means we are committing future generations to a planet where sea level has risen by 10 to 12 meters. Okay, so the, the two unstable ice sheets are the, are the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet. So if those two ice sheets melt, it's a 10 to 12 meter rise in sea level. 
if all of the Antarctic ice sheet melts, that's about a global increase in sea level of 60 to 70 meters. Okay, that is not on the cards right now, but the 10 to 12 meter rise is something we Dramatic. may trigger. Okay, it, will, it will take several centuries to melt, but our generation will, for always, will always be the one that, that will be known as the generation that had a, the last chance to prevent this from happening, and we did it. Now, um, in that case, where, this, where we trigger the melting, we will still live with sea level rise of between 1 and 2 meters during the course of this century, okay, which is still enough to displace hundreds of millions of people across the world. So, we were also, and we are already affected by sea level rise, increasingly so across the planet. And that's just a, a picture of the big the iceberg. 5,800 square kilometers, one of the biggest single icebergs ever seen by humans. That broke off in July 2017. That's one third of Kruger National Park. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of the scale at which things are happening on these massive ice sheets. So the, the rate of, of melting in the last 10 years is, is unprecedented. And then of course, across the world, the extreme storms are getting more intense in a warmer world. And I think we will also see increasingly political consequences of big disasters. I think the Australian fires is one example, where governments are not paying sufficient attention to these problems. There's going to be a price to pay. And it may also happen in the United States eventually, if we have one, another of these Category 5 hurricanes making landfall with economic impacts and impacts on people's lives. They will be eventually consequences for not taking action. Okay, now the, the last few slides are specifically projecting the changes in African climate and southern African climate. For that we use climate models. Let me just say that the climate models that generate all these projections used um, by the IPCC processes and regionally by our own government in the national communications on climate change these, mathematical, these models are all mathematical. They are based on the laws of physics, momentum, energy and mass conservation. So they are as objective as it can come in terms of projections of future change. Now, such a model is simply provided with a pathway of greenhouse gas changes into the future. And then, based on that pathway and that additional ability of the atmosphere to absorb heat through the greenhouse gases, the mathematical model simulates how the climate system responds. So, I'll first show an animation going from 1971 till the end of the century. It's showing changing temperatures in Africa. For each year, the temperatures are expressed as an anomaly of the average climate from 1971 to 2000. And what it shows is in yellow those regions that were warm in a specific year and in blue the regions that were cool in a specific year. And then later on we will move into the future. So the first thing to note is that climate models are, are quite capable of simulating variability. So the, the warm years for us are usually our new years. The cool years are typically La Niñas. And as we reach uh, the, the 1990s, you can see that already there are fewer and fewer warm years because the greenhouse effect is working. We've already warmed by about 2 degrees Celsius in the present day. So as we approach the present day, you can see the, the cool years are almost gone entirely already. And then what you'll see is this pattern of, of southern Africa warming so fast. So this, this animation below is for the low mitigation future and on top we have one for this modest to high mitigation future. So it speaks for itself, right? By the 2030s, no cool years anymore. And in the 2040s you'll see those dark red, those dark orange colors, those are plus 3 degree years and plus four degree years in, in, in the dark orange, occurring in the very near future. Mm -hmm. So individual years that are four degrees warmer than what they are supposed to be are part of the next 30 years. Part of the next? 
next 30 years, already in the next 10 to 30 years we have them occurring, not every year, but some year. And that will bring devastating impacts, as I'll, as I'll speak about later. But in the last 30 years, as you can see, it's a, it's a different world. Right? We have warmed then by about 6 degrees Celsius. And it's a completely different region. And we will see widespread impacts in such a, a low mitigation field. But even for quite strong mitigation, not as strong as Paris Agreement, but reasonably strong, still requiring some significant effort, we remain committed to that increase in the order of 4 degrees out. So take note of the fact that we are extremely vulnerable in the region, uh, and we are committed to further warming, even under strong mitigation. But we can still avoid this type of future, which is a devastating one for Southern Africa. I'll speak about that now. So, um, just to bring these points home, um, if we look at different climate models, they are all projecting these drastic temperature increases for our region, so there is very little uncertainty. Um, it's more difficult to project changes in future rainfall patterns. Because to do that, a mathematical model must simulate rainfall and, of course, clouds, which is more challenging. But nevertheless, despite these challenges, there's still a clear message for us. So these are, these are some brand new results that not even Bish has seen before. They are the latest analysis from the big global data set called CMIP6. These are changing rainfall patterns across the world at 1.5, 2, 3 and 4 degrees Celsius of global warming. Now if we, for a, if we for a start look here at, let's say we for a start look at 3 degrees Celsius of global warming. The important message you should see as Southern Africans is that we are living in an extremely unlucky part of the world. That's why we are climate change hotspots. Yeah. We are one of few regions in the world where drier conditions are expected as the climate is changing. In the tropics, in the big convection currents, and in the high latitudes of the northern hemisphere with all the cold fronts, the warmer atmosphere leads to more rainfall in general. But for us, all the air that is rising in the warmer tropics because of the rotation of planet Earth, sinks in the subtropics. So the, as we make the planet warmer, we have stronger convection in the tropics, the tropics gets wetter, the subtropics at the same time as more sinking air and gets generally dry. When an individual storm system occurs in the subtropics, it can still hold more moisture than ever before. So we, our storm systems, when they occur, bring more devastating rainfall events. But on the average, our region is projected to become dry. Now, where you see this, this grayish stippling, that is where the climate change signal has not yet manifested clearly. So you can see under 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, we are still avoiding impacts over large parts of Southern Africa in terms of rainfall. Not in terms of temperature, in terms of rainfall. We are not yet losing the rain as severely as starts to happen at 2 degrees of global warming and then progressively so at higher degrees of global warming. For Southern, Africans, for Southern Africans, there is immense value in trying to restrict the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Even at 2 degrees Celsius, there are still some advantages, but after that, we lose significant portions of our rainfall. When a warm and dry region like ours becomes drastically warmer, and to that we are committed, and dry, then it limits what we can do in terms of adaptation. So, if we, if we zoom into the Southern African region, the message for our region is generally drier, but somewhere over central to northern Mozambique, and in some projections also southern Mozambique, it's projected to become wetter because of the more frequent landfall of the tropical lows and, and cyclones. The southwestern Cape in South Africa, drastically dry. 
That is the one part in our region where we can already detect the decay. And that is because in a warmer world, the frontal systems are pushed towards the bones. So we lose the frontal area. And if we, I'll just show two more graphs before I summarize. If we look, for example, at the Tierwater's Kloof catchment, the biggest dam in Cape, that supplies Cape Town with water, on the y axis we have rainfall anomalies, uh, sorry, x axis, on the y axis we have temperature anomalies. The blue dots is the present day period, and then we move through time with the warmer colors. So from a system that has this natural variability I've been speaking about, we are moving to a system in the next 50 years where most years are dry. And towards the end of the century, every year is drier than what's expected. So it's clear that that city cannot grow sustainably without a new water resource. They've already built all the dams they can build. If we look at other parts in South Africa, we get the same message. This is Limpopo province. Okay, Limpopo province, exactly the same type of message, except that in the interior regions, the temperature increases are much higher. So, also more multi-year droughts in the near future, but temperature increases may exceed, in some individual years, 8 degrees Celsius, an individual year towards the end of the century. This is a devastating change in terms of what we can do in terms of agriculture. So, so let me let me let me summarize. Um, the first thing to take note of for this region is that our temperatures are rising faster than the global average. On the average, about at twice the global rate of temperature increase. That means we are committed to further warming and we need to prepare for that warming. Um, just think about heatwave days impacting on human mortality in the first place. But also in terms of the cattle industry, as I've mentioned. A higher fire danger is, of course, another natural outcome of a climate system that becomes generally drier and drastically warmer. So just, just from temperature, the temperature changes on its own, we are facing a range of risks. Now in terms of rainfall, I would say the biggest single risk South Africa is facing in the short term is a day zero event occurring in the Gauteng province. What do we need for a day zero event to occur? Well, at the end of the 2015-16 drought, the wall dam was sitting at 27%. When it falls to below 20%, it's not really possible anymore to pump water to Gauteng because of the low quality of the water, below 20%. And also because of the engineering constraints in pumping the water uphill to Gauteng. So we, we got very, very close at the end of that big drought. Mm. And that was three years of drought that brought us into that position. So, when all the mega dams in, South, in eastern South Africa are completely full, 100% for all of them, which never happens, of course, then there is five years of water for the Gauteng pockets. So our water security is never better than five years. Um, all that it takes to bring a day zero event, with that I just mean a Gauteng supply is heavily compromised from the eastern dams. Um, all that it takes is four or five years of consecutive droughts. Okay. And because of climate change, in a world where temperature has risen to above 1.5 degrees Celsius, that becomes an increasingly likely event. That is a major risk we have to prepare for. On the land litigation, that is an increasingly likely event over the next 10 to 50 years. Of course, it's already a major risk in the Cape Town region. Every year that we are warming the planet, the, the risk for the next day zero type drought in Cape Town is increased. And then um, the IPCC in a special report said the, the tipping point for cattle production and maize production in Southern Africa is around 3 degrees Celsius of global warming. 
So if we warm the region by 6 degrees Celsius, the maize crop is likely to collapse and the cattle industry in the warmest places, Limpopo, Northwest Botswana, Zambia, is likely to collapse. Okay, so just imagine the future Southern Africa without our staple food maize and without the cattle of Southern Africa. <coughs> That's a different world. But already under 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, we expect increased hits on these industries with, with uh, more frequently occurring very warm years when there's a very, very big reduction in maize crop yield and in, in cattle production. And then finally, um, the last reason why we've been identified as a hotspot is that our most eastern, the most eastern parts in this region, specifically our neighbor, our neighbor Mozambique, is extremely vulnerable to more frequently occurring what the Americans would call Category 4 and 5 hurricanes. Okay, the intense tropical cycle. We've now seen what they can do in Beira. These storms are already producing 10 to 20% more rainfall than in the past. But take note of the fact that Maputo is also vulnerable. And even the Church Bay in South Africa is, is vulnerable to the occurrence or the landfall of a Category 4 or 5 hurricane. Okay, and that, that, as we've seen, will have devastating impacts on people, but of course also longer lasting impacts on the economy. So, um, Fish, Jane, I hope that's more or less what I was supposed to say today, and I, I'm, I'm of course around. I hope we can have some discussion if we have time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think you've confirmed uh, the scientific basis for...